and I'm live, but I'm probably, I had to look over here. It's weird because right now I wanted to try it from the studio computer, which means I have to look this way to look at the camera, but the screen's over here, but i am got to change some settings real quick to fix that. But welcome. I have a few things to talk about today. I do have notes, so I will pull my notes up, which are also on this side here. Uh, not much in terms of notes as I... Still don't have any plans to go on any traveling anytime soon. I've been trying to put that in the beginning of the vlog where I just say, hey, this is where I plan to travel to. Uh, that way, if people want to be at some of the events, I mean, kind of. I'm traveling this afternoon to a local event called IT in the D. So it's a meetup for a Detroit networking professional. So there's that going on. So that's a thing I'll be doing. But let me switch the camera around over here. So I want to be able to read the comments. But I want to be able to pull back and forth between it because of the different things I want to be able to display. And yes, I did do some upgrades. As a matter of fact, where'd the box go? The box is left. But uh, I have face tracking now. And I'm doing this because what it'll do is not track devices. Uh, people complained about it. And there you go. Hey, look, it lost my face. When it loses my face, it'll focus on objects. But then once it figures out where my face is, it'll track that. It's been an annoyance for a little while. So studio upgrades. All it really is is this is a Sony A66 uh, camera with a Sigma 30 millimeter 1.4. Uh, gives you that nice separation. So even if I move a little closer, get a nice separation between me and the background. Um, that's the studio upgrades. So sound is a bit low. That we can compensate for, I think. Where do we turn the sound up at? Maybe here? Is that better? I don't know. I guess I could always switch to the other microphone. I actually usually, and I'm not using it at the moment, I usually have this one for my vlogs. Uh, I could actually bounce back and forth between them. Maybe I'll switch back to using that because it's probably easier to do it that way. In and out. Sound is cutting out. All right, we'll just switch to the other one. Let's do it that way. Let's switch to this. Hey, now I'm on this microphone. This one probably works better. Uh, I'm not going to lie. This is, yeah. The, it's the studio set up for studio recording. This is actually local to my PC. And this Yeti mic uh, is really where... It just works. That's one of the reasons I use it. People, you know, talk about different tools and things like that or spend a lot of money on things. Honestly, Yeti microphone, you can find these things used for sometimes under $100. Uh, highly recommend them. Definitely work really well. <laughs> so some people say it sounds the same either way. Um, but we're going to be talking today and I actually, uh, I want to get some feedback from the brain trust, the people that follow me, because that's where some of this will start actually. My camera is slightly out of focus. That's fixable. There we go. This is my studio camera has become my webcam. Uh, and I set it to manual focus. That way it's just in focus all the time instead of hunting. Because it does that. So now I'm a little bit better in focus. Yeah, it should sound better now as I stopped looping it through the studio setup. Nonetheless, let's uh, dive into the Cisco thing. Now, I have the Cisco dashboard set up already, so let me pull it up. But I don't have it fully set up. And this is part of Cisco's idea to compete. <laughs> I'm laughing because compete is not how I look at this. Um, I don't, I, what I'm really going to ask here of my audience is, actually, I have, I have too many windows open. No. All right. So I want to make sure. I'm opening the right ones. This is the Cisco business dashboard that is supposedly, if those of you who are familiar with Unify, the concept of this is to have a unified dashboard, much like the Unify platform, where you can control all of your Cisco devices and things like that. I have found it less than intuitive, would probably be an understatement. Uh, I've got some things set up, but I'm just like, oh man, it is... Um, really been a pain dealing with it and the little nuances of setting it up. I tweeted because out of aggravation uh, about finding forum posts that were inaccurate. As a matter of fact, the, um, the whole setup of this thing has been a little bit convoluted. Then when you set it up, it turns out it needs a self 
self-signed, uh, you can't use a self-signed uh, certificate. Oh, it's it's definitely not a Unify ripoff. I will give them that. They created a completely worse system. Like if they ripped off Unify, that would be an improvement. They did not rip off Unify. And I've been trying to do a review on it, and I thought I was just an idiot. I'm not going to lie here. I kept looking at all the challenges, like, hey, look at the lack of event logs that are going on here. Um, which is weird because I've tried to I tried to get things in here. I couldn't get them in here. And it turns like turns out the reason I can't get them in here is because it doesn't accept self-signed certs. Also, the Cisco small SBS devices, which are some of these small business uh, switches, which let me log into one of those and pull it up for you. Um, they don't th the Cisco instructions are wrong. There's a forum post by someone who is also trying to get this working. The forum post describes the right way to do it. But it's also funny because Cisco answers with the wrong way to do it. Uh, well, they just don't give the, all the details. I can't say they didn't actually give bad information. They just didn't really give any information. And uh, when I posted this on LinkedIn, one person had what has been my favorite comment. Um, the comment that someone had was, whoops. Let me copy that and paste it in here and open up another tab. The, so we're going to. Share this tab instead. Here's one of the switches that I'm trying to get adopted in here. Adopted is the word I use because that's what Unify uses. So I want it entered into the Cisco dashboard. Oh, by the way, this is the, my favorite part. We're doing this all in real time. <sighs> wow. Processing data. Go Cisco with your brand new CBS 350 switch and its incredible speed at which it chugs along this is my first problem with the review is this is slow but uh don't worry i don't care if you have the password to this for my cisco dashboard secret um but yeah this actually let me refresh the page but right here this is the dashboard connection here's the cisco ip address for the server um it just don't connect and it turns out the reason it doesn't connect let me refresh the page which will probably log me out and cause the page to also pause greatly There we go. Now we can go back over here. Um, one of the things that someone pointed out, let's go here to administration. According to Cisco's uh, documentation, and we go here to the Cisco dashboard, you put in the organization name that has to match the name, and we'll switch over to here. Uh, in here, you set up the network configurations. Where is it at? Yeah, under network. Oh, and if you can't tell which network's listed here, it's because they don't give you a listing. Their their network is a map or a list. You can do a list here, then it switches. It defaults to map. I don't know why. So we have a network called Tom's Lab, and we have Tom's Lab right here. Let me zoom this in a little bit. We have Tom's Lab. So then we match it over here to Tom's Lab, Tom's Lab, uh, IP address. We put all this information in here, and it's supposed to connect, but then it doesn't. And you'd think this little checkbox that says enable would enable it, but that doesn't work. You think this would enable it. That doesn't work. It turns out, and we can, this is faster. I did learn if you type this, uh, hold on, num locks on. I have a second keyboard, but it is a small one. So S N M P. Oh man, it stopped. This Cisco dashboard is pain. It's so slow to use, but you got to go here into the S N M P and enable SNMP to talk to the Cisco dashboard. That's not in the documentation. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, okay. So the documentation has been hard to get through. And then, but what this is all leading to is one, I'm asking, have any of you used this and decided you thought it was good? And I'm just the person that's having a hard time with it. Or, and I posted this on LinkedIn. I said, are any of you using it? And my favorite comment is someone who said, I hired a consultant that couldn't get this working right, and Cisco support was terrible. Uh, they hired a consultant from Cisco that couldn't get it working right. Like, I I think I just have to do a review of it and be like, this is hard. Um, it is just, I don't know. I'm not happy with it. Uh, one of the things, oh, okay. I, I have Cisco business APs. The GUI's a bit, man, I have to switch to expert to do basic things just to let... Uh, me set up expert every time. Yeah, that's a weird one too. I have one of the Cisco access points too. I guess while I'm here, we can talk about the Cisco access point. I haven't even figured out how to get that into the uh, mix. And damn it. There we go. 
So let me pull up the Cisco access point, which by the way, has a completely different dumb problem. Um, we'll open a new tab. I don't think I can show this. I can show this part. So this is the Cisco access point to log in. Okay, I'm already logged in, so it didn't. Um, they use like your old HTML pop-ups. They don't have a regular form to, I, I don't know why they did that, which is a new pain. So I work with, uh, whoops. I work with a lot of Cisco clients. Don't use this. <laughs> so I feel the same way. I I don't get it. Like they made, this whole dashboard thing is way harder than it needs to be. And it's confusing and not well documented. Now the access point's a different animal. Um, I have the I don't know. I'm not happy with it because I got to play with this again, and I I just got to sit down and organize all the aggravation I had with it. I couldn't figure out why things kept not working, and it turns out most of the not working problems I was having are just something with the Cisco. I don't I don't know. Some devices, if you set this to WPA three don't like connecting. And I don't mean like some old ancient devices Tom has laying around. I mean, things like Pixel 6 phones. Now, my phone's had an update since I've tested this, so I don't know if that's going to be fixed. But I kind of want to rant here a little because I can't believe Cisco is even the least bit aware that other products, not just Unify, like other products in the market exist that work well. And I don't get it. Like, how did they miss the mark so far on this? I saw SS, SSH and Telnet. Tom seems good to have code of counsel. Yeah, I understand why the CLI. Like, the reason you want CLI is because you've tried using the Cisco uh, non-CLI system. Well, oh, by the way, in that couple minutes I was talking, and this is a default. I just left the defaults on. Uh, we have now logged ourselves out of the switch. If you look away from the switch for a couple minutes, it's like, oh, let me log you out because that's how you do security. You just set all your logout times to be five minutes, and then you processing data. Processing data. Oh, joy. Do, do, do. This is why you load the command line. They they just want to torture you until you use the command line. They're like, this is how bad web interfaces are. No, this is how bad Cisco web interfaces are. <laughs> go, Cisco, go. Now, functionally, I think the switch is fine functionally. If you can get past the bad, terrible web interface, the lousy Cisco dashboard utilization stuff, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I'm still going to get it working. I'm determined and I'm going to document how hard it was to get working as part of the review. I'm not going to give up. I want to give up. It is part of it. But functionally, I think it's a cool, like, hey, look, I can look at the, it's a working switch. And it has probably the standard Cisco reliability of a working switch. It's just all the quirkiness you have to deal with um, about it. The, the at least it's affordable. So I will I will throw it out there that Cisco made these switches at a decent price. So let me just pull that up real quick here. Um, because they are uh shares to have instead. They're not outlandishly priced for a Cisco. I mean, this is a eight port PoE switch for about 400 bucks from Cisco. It's not the cheapest switch out there, but it's not outlandishly uh, priced either. So, you know, I'm like, okay, I, I I get where they're coming from. At least that's a reasonable price for some of these. But the pain in the butt with it is just, yeah. I think this is dying on them. This whole this whole marketing plan of nobody got fired for buying IBM, nobody got fired for buying Cisco. I think that's that's a dying marketing plan. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, does the switch have a serial port interface? Yes, it does. Um, it does have that. Matter of fact, you can. It's uh, your standard. I don't. Does it have a close up of it? I think you can probably see it from this uh, this one here. But it's got a little. It actually has USB serial and a um, mini. Mini, that's mini USB, right? Yeah, mini USB. So, yes, it does have serial ports. Oh, the Ingenious 10. So the Ingenious one is a whole nother. I, they sent it to me. And my review is going to be talking about this aspect of it for sure. Because you guys aren't going to like this. 
I don't know. I, I don't like it. So I'm going to go with who's this for? Let's go ahead and go back over to Amazon. And uh, who's this switch for? Because uh, I guess I got to search for it. Hold on. Because it's not on Amazon right now. Where, do they? I think somewhere there's a price point on it. It's hard to it. I got to search a little more to find someone who has a price on it because the prices I've been seeing on this are not good. Like, I don't know why they want so much money for these where streak wave has one. So it looks like it's, uh, Oh, here we go. This doesn't, even, this price doesn't even make sense. Is it? Well, that ain't the right one. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> this is even better. <laughs> this is the problem I've had looking it up. I don't know how much this switch costs because I can't find it on Amazon right now, but the price, this is, this is the part that makes me laugh here. We have an MSRP of six ninety nine, dollars but you can get it for the low, low price of $200 over MSRP. Uh, uh, who won even six ninety nine dollars MSRP for, for a 10 gig switch. What? That is way too much money. Uh, I don't understand. Like you can buy the Unify switches and the Unify switches. We'll pull them up real quick. Uh, UI. Let's go and look at the networking switches from uh, our friend switching. And let's look at their 10 gig ones. They have a couple of the comparable ones are going to be well right here. This one already beats it. This is a hundred dollars less with more ports. So here's a 16 port one for a hundred dollars less. There's your first problem. But if you go down, where's that one they have? They have another inexpensive one from Unify. That's also 10 gig. Is it listed? They, I don't like the way they divide some things on their switch. Just give me the switches. Where's the 10 gig switches? And you got to search for it. But they do have a small aggregation switch and it's cheaper. Like it, it's just a better price for 10 gig SFP. Where is it? Does it suggest it if I click on this one? Probably. No, go back. There it is. Switch aggregate aggregation. I can buy, this is $269 and in stock. That's one of the reasons I was looking for this one is it's usually in stock. I can buy this, which is um, eight ports. So it's two less, four less ports than the Ingenious for $269. I can buy two of these and have more ports and less money than the Ingenious. I don't get it. Like, who are they trying to price this for? Uh, they're... Nexus Data Center, Meraki Security. Yeah. Uh, Cisco GUI on anything always sucked. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. As someone who lives in the corporate world, you live in a CLI. It's the only way. Like Cisco trying to help small businesses by putting a UI on it. Just quit. Just stop now, guys. It's just torture. You're. It's not. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, although unconfirmed, should we consider the market flooded with non-genuine? Is this an issue still? I don't know. I think they've cracked down on it, but I don't know for, I can't tell you that with absolute certainty that there's no more, uh, fake Cisco's out in the market. I know that was a problem for a little while. I don't know if it still is a continuing and ongoing problem. Try neck gear. I've never been impressed much with the Netgear stuff, but I mean, I wouldn't use any of their cloud stuff for Netgear, but their non-cloud stuff, like their managed switches, I mean, they seem to work. And Genius Switch looks like a copy of the Dell SF-115, which also is a half-width switch. Uh, we use two of these Dells for iSCSI networking for ASXI servers, perfect storage switch. Well, yes, no. Um, the uh, I say yes, no, because it's like there's... It's 
overpriced, I think, for what it is. And who knows? Maybe they white label because Dell doesn't build. If I'm call me out if I'm wrong on this, but to my understanding, Dell doesn't really build things. They brand them usually in terms of the switches. Not I, they build computers, but the other stuff. Oh, by the way, this is a. Oh, that's right. It won't. It won't refocus on there. Uh, this neckgate back scratcher. For, <laughs> um, I I like when companies send me swag. Neckgate. They sent me a back scratcher. They sent a couple of them to my office along with some hats, and I thought it was kind of cool. I like swag. I've been moving away from Unify. Just don't trust them. Been working with Aruba CX, Aruba Instant On. Really like them. Uh, my problem with Aruba Instant On is you're locked into their cloud, and their cloud is so basic. Um, I guess it gets the enough stuff done, but it's not it's not wonderful. Um, yeah, it, it just doesn't hold up to the features that Unify has. I really would love to see. I mean, I'm all in on a competitor for Unify. I, I would a, a real competitor because someone's going to go, what about TrendNet, Tom? And I'm like, TrendNet's had security issues. TrendNet has been slow to get things update. TrendNet has managed to have a, a an even less clear path to end of life than Unify uh, and worse documentation. So... Uh, what about Mikrotik? Mikrotik is a love-hate relationship. Now, if you're using, and I've done a video on this, if you use uh, Mikrotik Switch OS, pull this up. There, uh, Switch OS is better than their router OS because it's a little bit more usable. The downside is router OS and switch OS are not always the most well-documented or easy to find documentation on. So there's a learning curve. Now, if you overcome that learning curve, which they're popular, for example, because they're very inexpensive, uh, they're popular in the uh, ISP space, the wireless ISP, especially space where it's a low margin business. And you know, if you get them figured out pretty well, you become an expert at them. Awesome. Uh, but you, you'll you find a lot of things. And I, I always like someone summed it up in my forums once of you'll find you'll, you'll Google for a problem you're having with your Mikrotik where the instructions didn't make any sense. And someone has an incantation as in some type of command you'll type in that won't make any sense. And you're not sure why it fixed it. But, you know, if you copy and paste these commands, it'll fix the problem you're having. Uh that's the kind of problems that you kind of run into if you try to do anything complicated. Now, just for basic VLANs, yeah, they work fine. Uh, I was, if you're not using the Mikrotix, if you use them with a Switch OS and just need VLAN stuff, awesome, they seem to work. Once you start needing advanced stuff, that is a little bit, it becomes a lot more convoluted to do. It's not that it can't do it, it's just the learning curve. If you need good management, like a centralized management for all your switches. Now you're back to something that you want to centrally manage. You're back up to, like we were talking here about Aruba, uh, which at least does give you some central management, but you're locked into their dashboard, or you can go back to Unify and, hey, you can self-host the controller. Cisco's concept of self-hosting controller is a noble thought, but they've just it's the poor, uh, poor implementation. You're, uh, yeah, almost all Cisco GUIs are pretty bad. Yes, uh, they they work, but you have to figure it out with all the nerd. Well, if they just had documentation, if the documentation was represented, if the forum posts at where Cisco employees reply with the wrong information, at least there's some forum posts I found that got me as far as I have, and it wasn't Cisco employees answering the questions. Well, they were answering. They just didn't have the right answers. Uh, Dell does build their own switches about eight, 10 years ago, bought force 10 employ those people to make Dell switches. Well, they do make the son. They do like make and support some of the Sonic OS ones too, but I don't know about the smaller ones, but maybe. Hello from Switzerland. I'm actually a little bit earlier because I have somewhere to go today. I, I, I can go for the live stream for a little while, but I do have an event to go to. I agree with what you're saying about Aruba. So many micro and small networks don't need more than basic settings. Yeah, that's at least they got that covered with Aruba. Um, I've used them. Matter of fact, I have an Aruba switch in my stack right now. I mean, I think they're reliable, good switches. What do you recommend for basic setup for home use uh, with the ESXi host, a PFSense Edge, Unify equipment? 
the unified equipment is just so simple. And uh, with me mentioning um, this system right here for 269, I mean, ESXi 269 gives you eight 10 gig SFP ports. So you need 10 gigs of switching. Uh, and you can buy these cards. Intel cards are like under $100 for Intel uh, SFP cards. DAC cables are cheap. You can build a 10 gig uh, storage server connection with a 10 gig hypervisor connection. And you're talking about, I mean, a brand new switch for 269 Granted, the Mikrotik one, uh, if you only need like the, the four port Mikrotik, I love that switch. That is so, and Mikrotik has a few other ones that are pretty cheap. They still sell that one for 129 bucks. And uh, that's a that's a hard to beat price uh, at 129 for the the four port micro tick. Like that's the bottom of the budget. But a hundred dollars more, you get you get eight ports. So uh, micro tick is the main target for junior hackers. Well, the problem is a lot of the defaults were bad on micro tick, and uh, default settings are what most people use. Therefore. That's not too surprising. So they got left at default. So the because of those default settings being open on the public side, there are tons of hacks against Mikrotix from that. Uh, SwitchOS is very basic. RouterOS has a lot of features. Things available in SwitchOS are not available in RouterOS, vice versa. Correct. Uh, you may as well go PFSense Plus with the Home Lab. They have a free license for your Home Lab. So I do recommend PFSense Plus for that. Ubiquity can't do Q and Q nor VXLAN. Uh, Maker Quick can do it. Now, Corey's got a really good point here. Yes, uh, you can do that on there. So if you have a use case for doing VXLAN and tying it to your switches or Q and Q, yes, that's where you're going to out, outrun the, out use the limitations of the Unify system. Poor implementation for three legs. <laughs> Most important ingredient is the engineer. Yeah. I think most of Tom's clients are paying for his uh, experience, expertise, and you seem to be passionate about IT. I am passionate about IT and teaching people about it. Uh, do you use the captive portal for your customers for hosting unified controllers? Pretty much never. I, I think we have a customer, and even they moved away from trying to do it inside of I don't think they're I don't think we have anyone doing it inside of the Unify controller anymore. There's third party companies that do portals. That's just a better experience. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Mikrotik can do OSPF as well. That's true. Like, they pack a million features into Mikrotik. That's also what adds to the complexity of them. It's just the documentation and things like that. And I don't use them enough. People always ask me, why don't you make some videos on there? And I'm like, why? I mean, I just don't use them enough to make a video on it as a topic. Uh, I'll bring something up today because a few people are talking about this. And I got to figure out how I'm always thinking about how I want to handle things. Um Let's go to this particular post in Reddit because Tom spends too much time on Reddit. Uh, if you want to know where you can find me sometimes, it's probably wasting time on Reddit. I know. I, I, I don't know if reading all the time is wasting time, but I like this. Uh, let's see. Share this tab instead. Why are so many YouTubers advocating red teams and hacking? Well, because it's cool. It's sexy. Who doesn't want to be a hacker? Who doesn't want to you know make content that gets lots of views like that? But. Uh, I was actually happy because I said, you know, I create more blue team oriented content. And essentially what I'm saying here is I avoid some of the um, just getting people excited about hacking. But I do want and I was having a conversation with my friends at Huntress because, well, they they had a conversation with us because we we resell Huntress and it was a security incident. And I it's just not as glamorous when we talk about how we do investigations and things like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's fun doing CTF and doing any of the hacking stuff, but I'm not going to do that. There's enough people doing it. Matter of fact, there's a ton of people doing it who are way better at it and focus on that. But I want to do cover what I do want to cover is the real world. So I'm going to probably work on a couple of videos of like what it looks like on the back end of a security incident. It's not exciting, um, but it's very important as someone who works on the blue team, and making sure we go through a process when there's an incident. So incident comes in, Huntress noticed it. We put the host in isolation so we could stop the spread from the server. We actually stopped a pretty big incident from happening on a big client. Now, we don't manage that client. So that's where they're doing. They have their own internal IT. They use us for just the Huntress side of it. But we were still just with Huntress alone able to lock down their systems to stop the spread of the malware and give them an opportunity to 
you know, break it apart. But I might walk through a video on that process of how we do that investigation. Uh, we actually had a really dumb investigation. I want to cover at least one of those. Um, we have a, a client we do manage. This is a fun one. We have a client. We manage that client and they got rid of a few employees. We're aware of it. The uh, manager thought he would just crack passwords and download software. Now, the manager was told not to do this by other managers, but decided he was going to be smarter than calling me, my company, I should say. Uh, so they loaded some software and created a security incident. So it went from a managed, like you could have just called us to have us reset these systems to, oh, now you created a security incident by loading garbage software on a system to try and crack a password. Those are fun. Um, so yeah, I might do a few videos just kind of breaking and detailing out what we do on the back end with our clients, because it's a realistic representation of what goes on on the blue team side. I don't like to try and glamorize or overhype it. I like to tell people what a real job looks like in security, uh, for doing some of these things. Uh, can I recommend captive portal software? It usually comes down to, uh, you can Google them. There's a few of them out there. Uh, we ended up, the client ended up hiring a company to custom write what they wanted. They wanted, first the idea was to flex, make, to see how flexible the Unify one was to do what they wanted and it didn't work really well. So they ended up hiring a third party uh, to write the software because they wanted a whole integration as part of an experience at their event location. It really wasn't possible with the Unify, but I mean, you can specify third party ones. I'm not an expert in that uh, to know the best ones. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I don't know if you've seen the incident today, Travis. So, so that's a that's a thing to happen again today. Well, not the one I talked about. This is, um, I don't know if you overheard the conversation, uh, we stopped Mimi Cats. Well, Hunter stopped Mimi Cats. <laughs> we just had to tell them what domains to block. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Travis works uh, at the office as well. So uh, all the fun stuff. Uh, Migrotic can do MPLS, uh, but you want their high end router, not the cheaper switches for stuff. Like it'll offload CPU and the switch chipset uh, can really cut performance. Now, this is one of the things that comes up a lot. People go, Oh man, I really want my routing done in my router, not in my or not uh, routing done on my switch, not on my router. There's reasons and there's design architecture that requires that uh, for implementations. But this is where just because the Migrotic can do routing in the switch doesn't mean it should because it may not be able to do it very fast now if it's just some layer three routing in a switch for printers and small you know devices that don't have a lot of bandwidth requirements it may work fine if you have something that requires more speed you have to really consider the switch and its ability to process that um i'll also throw this out there because this comes up all the time captive portals are a headache if you can figure out a better way to do something without a captive portal. Your tech support will go down dramatically. The problem with captive portal is it's not well supported on all devices in a universal format. This means there's a ton of redirect problems you run into, especially with phones. Computers do a pretty good job of it, but phones do a terrible job of it. And people will tell you they end up with all these help desk problems, so to speak, where they're trying to have everyone agree to some stupid terms and conditions, and everyone just gets aggravated trying to use their phone on the captive portal because it doesn't direct where it's supposed to go. The phone doesn't read the captive portal. The phone won't stay connected to the Wi-Fi because it doesn't see the redirect for the portal, so it keeps disconnecting them, not allowing them to agree to the terms. Avoid them unless you absolutely need them. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Cody here. He hates captive portals too. Anyone who's, everyone who wants a captive portal has never supported a captive portal. That's how I feel about captive portals. People who keep asking me they want one have never dealt with actually using one. Uh, once you've dealt with using them, you're like, oh, wow, this is terrible. I'm like, yes, this is terrible. <laughs> Yeah, it is just it it's it's better to uh giving giving free passwords isn't a good idea for guests. It's better to just roll what the Wi-Fi password is, set that up and like roll a new Wi-Fi password once in a while on your guest network. Go for that. That's an easier way to do it. So ah uh, yes. <laughs> Captive portals are probably the dumbest thing ever. Another plus, you can tell who the real technician people are. You can tell who's worked with captive portals because they're the ones commenting on this. 
Ah. Uh, let's see. Oh, a lot of it ties to the Wi-Fi solution as well. They're just always a headache. I've never seen one just work well. I've always, it's almost phones are, are where most of the problem comes in with them. Like the, the computers seem to connect to them, but the phones are just like mess. All right. Now I got too many things open. I was thinking about, I can, I have my, uh, I need to SSH into my, I just spun up a new instance because I had a private one for the Cisco dashboard. This is running locally here. Um, I need, I, I got another one I'm going to spin up in the cloud. Maybe I'll document that process of how you load it. I, yeah, this is, I, I said, this is, I want to finish this so I could just have less of a headache of it. I just kind of want it done so I can say I did the review. I don't like it because I can already tell the review. I'm, I'm going to go through the diligence of setting it up, but I didn't like it. I like that I keep having to log back into this. I should change the timeout settings on there, but I do it just to prove that they have really weird defaults because they're Cisco. Oh, and someone had mentioned the basic versus advanced. It always defaults when you log into the web UI to basic. You have to hit the pull down here. I didn't look to see if there's a way to force it into advanced, but you have these where it just grays out a bunch of things. Um, but I will say this. The cool thing that they have in here um, for Cisco is this. I actually think this is great for people who have not used Cisco before. They have a VLAN wizard. I mean... This is actually a good thing. I, I plus 10 for Cisco for doing this. They have a welcome to VLAN configuration wizard. It's not bad. It, 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 you still have to understand Cisco's nomenclature for VLANs. It's not near as easy as Unify, but it gets you going. And you can, if you kind of go through it, you kind of get an idea as long as you Google a couple terms if you're not familiar with them. And you can go through this and go, oh, this is how I set up a VLAN in a Cisco. So I'm, I actually like that they did that. They also have an ACL configuration wizard. Uh, they have a getting started wizard, which I think is cool too. So I think though, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't checked this. I think their SSH stuff is still, um, that's a bug it, I've run into. I think the Cisco has it too, where when you try to get into these settings for the SSH, RSA and DSA keys. I can't remember if they're using, some of the other Cisco gear used to use a deprecated um, security. You used to have to do some changes in your Linux or a Linux system and say, yes, I'm willing to use older protocols. If you worked, you didn't use it at scale. Once you start scaling up with all those, they they are just a it's just a headache. I shut down pretty much all the captive portals. I manage <laughs> too many people with issues. Yeah, once you deal with it at scale with a lot of them, you just run into there. I mean, we actually do have one client that's got a few thousand people, um, and they're using the PF Sense captive portal. They do it to uh, control some bandwidth restrictions. It works. Um, it's not horrible. I think they have it set so once you do it, once you log in, you never expire. I did a video on how to do it in PF Sense. Uh, no plans at all about the Sophos firewalls. I one, I'm confused by them. Two, I talked to a lot of technicians that just don't like them. I'm also confused about the different versions of them. Uh, a lot of people just, I don't. I, other than people asking me about them, I don't see any of the other technicians, like other uh, IT professionals that have these out in the field. A lot of them just don't like them. And uh, we moved a few people off of Sophos. And I don't know, there's nothing about them that seemed compelling that made me want to jump on them. Like, oh man, it's got this amazing feature. The only kind of cool thing is, but I'm a little fuzzy on this, is if you buy everything Sophos from the Sophos endpoint management all the way to the Sophos, uh, firewall, allegedly there's a big relationship it can do. So you can do the same thing I'm doing with Huntress without buying a specialized firewall, which is like host isolation. But I don't know. Uh, I don't, there's, I haven't seen anything about it. If it has a killer feature for me to take the time to learn a new product, it kind of has to have a killer feature. Second, it should be something I've used out in the field because that way my experience isn't like, Hey, look, a thing that I tested. 
it takes a lot of time to test a product. And I try to share my experience from project, uh, products I've tested out in the field, deployed at clients, because then I give you a better overall uh, thing, like a feeling about the product of how it works. So. I was also confused about the version. I was hoping you can do some reading instead of me. Well, I did reading and I didn't get less confused about the Sophos firewalls. So um, I found people arguing in forums that didn't help me. So now Sophos has had some uh, vulnerabilities in it, but I will say that despite the many vulnerabilities they've had, they've been fast to fix them. So I, I'll give Sophos that. They've been on top of it. They've done good disclosures. They have automatic updates. But but people like to disable those automatic updates. Uh, there's a bunch, There was another article. I tweeted it the other day. Basically, people were complaining about the fact that the, um, what do you call it? Uh, there was like a ton of these still exposed with the flaw, but it's automatic updates are turned on on these. Well, by default, they are. That means someone actively went and turned off the updates. Now, one of the things that I don't know, I've heard people tell me is that the problem with the automatic updates is it breaks things that in, I, I don't use them. This is, and this is not something a review is going to tell you at all. It takes a, we deployed these at clients and this was the result after several updates, everything kept catching on fire. Everything was down because the updates broke. So we turned off automatic updates. Like there's a story as to why people are turning it off because the average admin, the less below average that we hear about, I would say is going to be someone who just puts things out there and isn't going to be um actively doing something the they're not going to go through the trouble they're going to leave everything at default which means it should be on automatic updates but the more advanced admin had some problems that caused them to go into that firewall and turn off automatic updates and i'm not sure why so that's it kind of gives me the wrong impression about it but i don't know uh let's see you Use Sophos XG Home. Sophos XG is expensive, though. Palo Alto is more interest. Okay. Have had no issues. Sophos Firewalls went XG about years ago for a client. It was annoying to use, especially for the price. It was very good to get rid of it. Hard, oh, hard no. Okay. Sophos is NGF Firewall. PF Sense is a little bit different solution. <laughs> anything bought by Thomas Bravo is generally a train wreck in the long term. You know, that's one of those things like it should be on a vendor checklist. Does Thomas Bravo own this product? <laughs> Fortinet is, uh, I tweeted, they, they're, they're in trouble again for an improper disclosure of security vulnerabilities. So there's that again, not the first time. Forty net, forty gate, yeah, they're uh, six thousand. It was yeah, it was uh, six thousand register. I think you're talking about the number of uh, exposed systems. Shiny website, I'm sold. Yeah, it looks like you have to Sophos firewall free trial. Price and buy. Apparently, everything's stuck behind. Uh, contact our sales team. So you get your base license. You get a free trial. But I don't know. There's, I'm not getting so get pricing. Oh, we have to talk to people to get pricing. We have to get on your mailing list to get pricing. <laughs> so let's uh, head over to the tweets I had related to these things. Let's see me complaining about Cisco and oh look this is the 4000 Sophos firewall is vulnerable to RCT attacks RCE um and this is one of those things people change things thousands of clients so vulnerable and this is because people change the default on them there's been a handful of vulnerabilities in the Sophos firewall they've been quick to patch but it you know it's also 
it's one of those things like people have all these uh things they want to do uh in you want to build it all into a firewall that has a web portal what could possibly go wrong with giving every user a web portal to self-service things remote ex code executions and sql injections those are if you're going to do it you've got to really harden against that type of thing uh we use a tool called zoros for uh layer seven I don't have a reason. Uh, don't have a reason to use Brave. I I prefer my browsers to update at the lightning speed and security that comes with Firefox and it comes with uh, Chrome. They both do a really really fast job on security. I just don't know the track record with Brave that I would trust my browser to them. The browser is the surface at which you hit crazy things on the internet and where the most likely attack is going to happen for me. Um, so having a browser to get hacked is a scary thing. So I run Chrome for my business and Firefox for my personal. Zone base versus interface base is just naming schemes. I've discovered CrowdSec IDS IPS, uh, but I experienced a CrowdSec that just eats all of your CPU resources. Is there a way to fix this? Uh, I would post in their forums. I don't use it commercially, so I don't know. I mean, I take that back. CrowdSec is on my website and it works. I don't see it consuming all my memory, but I do have CrowdSec uh, running on our website. I have the free version of XG in a nonprofit, uh, just a content filter. It's free and it works. Updates like a five-year uh, license works where I need it to. Okay. You like XG over Untangle? Okay. They send you the download link once you register. Interesting. Uh, doing a video and blocking TikTok with PF Blocker. No, no plans on doing that. What's the point of a captive portal? Uh, I guess because usually it's because people want someone to agree to terms and conditions of some sort. That's usually what I think. Uh, can I do a video? Maybe. I might do a sponsored video with them. They can uh, buy some time on my channel. Isn't Brave Chromium? Well, this is what, I'm not positive what Brave's using, probably Chromium, but this is the thing. Brave can't update until Chromium updates. So if there's a flaw found in Chromium, they have to wait for Chromium update and then Brave updates. What? I, this is a serious question. What is their lag time? I don't know. How how far behind are they from the latest Chromium engine to their engine? Is there any delay at all? Are they doing it within 24 hours, 48 hours? That's the question I'm trying to figure out. What I particularly dislike is vendors like Untangle moaned about XG. Sometimes I feel like Glass House. Mm. There's always some salesperson that misbehaves, I'm sure. Ah, oh, use links. There we go. Now we have our Linux friends here. <laughs> Chrome for work, Firefox for personal. Yeah, that's that's my uh, solution for this. What? Why want? Uh, you know, I remember the Brave one. Uh, didn't Brave get caught doing this? Let me Google it. Brave caught. Using. Uh, it was something problem. Oh, yeah, this problem here. I remember this incident, and I don't use it, but this is one of those things that came up was the uh, Brave Browser CEO apologizes for automatically adding affiliate links to cryptocurrency URLs. I mean, I don't know. It seems like a whoops. I know that happened a little while ago, but I, it's, it's a, I don't know. Browsers are your interface to the internet. So yes, that's a scary thing. Uh, are you using chat TP with your business in a way? No, no. Um, I might use it for some testing for some code writing. It's on my to-do list. The chat GPT servers end up like overloaded all the time, which kind of drives me nuts that, you know, you try to use it and sometimes it's usable. Sometimes it's not. I'm hoping they come out with a subscription. Uh, base models. I don't mind paying for it. Um, that way I can have access to it instead of watching the errors on there. But there's nothing. I, I'm not doing anything with it right now that's business related. I don't. 
it's way overhyped. It, you know, I think someone mentioned this last time, or maybe Linus said it. Uh, it confidently tells you anything, even if that thing is wrong. So I don't know. It, it's it's a more advanced Google search. The real worry I think people should have about the Chat GPT is how it's going to affect search engines. But it's also a double edged sword because it doesn't. Search engines at least give you enough results and let you kind of decide which result looks like the most accurate one. ChatGPT kind of removes that. It gives you what it thinks is the most accurate result. But if that's not verified, and coding is, an, is a big problem uh, with this, because if, and you know, I want to find this, I think Steve Gibson had covered this on one of the Security Now episodes, where a bunch of people all put a piece of insecure code in, because that insecure way of doing it was the top search result. Now, it did work for what you searched for, how to implement a thing, but that thing was done insecurely. So all these people end up with a piece of insecure code rep replicated through all these projects because it was the top SEO result, not the right answer. Um, it was the easiest way to get the uh, thing done, but not the most secure way. So you have to think a lot about what chat GPT, what it's going to be indexing for. Uh, just got a 700X train install, XDP and Janet, running into a bunch of issues. Zen 4 not supported. Um, I don't know, what are we using? We have... Oh, we have a 5900X. So we have a 5900, uh, Ryzen 9 5900. I don't know. I I don't think I've tried it on that one. Uh, post in their forums uh, if there's a problem and maybe they have a solution for it. I don't know that ChatGPT is just too good. I don't know if that's how I would describe it. Um... PF Sense Firewall UDM. I was having trouble getting WAN Cloud, nice slow browser, no mobile app access. Check both quickly and perfectly. Didn't change a thing. Oh, that's because you're testing Wi Fi. I liked Untangle 2, enjoying X XG more. Got to use it at 2 a.m. Got it. <laughs> ChatGPT with Microsoft Azure thing in the future. Yeah, Microsoft's investing money into it. Uh, ChatGPT is revolutionary because it gives people an understandable interface to talk to AI. You'll see this year that it means for society going to change a lot. Oh, I've heard that many times. Um, I don't think it's as much of a game changer. It's just the next iteration of some of those things. It's not... People are way overthink it. They, it, it's a good news topic for sure because it gets people so engaged and how excited they are over it. I like people excited about technology. So, yeah. Now, there are some other sides of uh, chat GPT that I think I'm not seeing much news about. And I thought about talking about it more myself is uh, what happens when you use chat GPT to create a bunch of convincing bots. And it's not likely that it's going to be used like the way people think it will be. Like a bunch of convincing bots is still going to cost you money. There's going to be a cost of renting a chat GPT or chat GPT like server system that will create a bunch of convincing bots. And what would you do with a bunch of convincing bots though that you could make money? And I'm not talking the kind of basic money that malware people make. I'm talking about some real money with market manipulation through stocks. That is an angle, not people. I don't hear as much talk about it. Maybe I just don't listen enough because I, I don't listen or read to every uh, chat GPT thing that's coming out there. But that could be if you had you look at the game stonks and game stonks is interesting. Lots of people on Reddit and, you know, the Wall Street bets and everything that happened with that. What if you could build an even bigger group of those people, but they aren't really people now you can scale it differently have people who are convincing because they're not people or chat GPT interacting in a convincing way. And then they all create accounts at different trading places, you know, the Robin hoods or whatever they do. And 
behave in a very real way. That is where I could see someone making some real money and it'd be worth investing the money into doing it. So that's kind of like, that's, it's not them writing code or some low hanging fruit of, oh, cool. Like I, I've seen all the trending topics of chat GPT writing malware and that getting overhyped. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it's, it's oversold, but I do think there is certain risks inside of it. I mean, but ChatGTP doesn't know what a MOSFET driver is. It found that information somewhere. It was a Google result. I'm sure if you start, and I've, I've told people this. There's a matter of fact, I've seen um, Dave's Garage did a good, good video on using Google searches. Matter of fact, I learned nothing new from it, but thought, wow, I never realized that this is a big deal to a lot of people, not knowing all the different ways you can use Google search. Uh, especially if I wanted to understand something like a MOSFET driver, would I Google how to use how does a MOSFET driver work or would I use an image search? I would actually start with the image search. I frequently start with an image search because if I need something explained to me in a better diagram of electronics layouts, if I start by doing a Google image search for the thing I want to understand how it works, I'll go to the site, not that's at the top of the ranking, but it has the best image that matches, which usually has content around the image to match. You know, those are ways you can use search to find the same thing chat GPT did. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but connect, if you want to connect. We're, we're actually funny. My friend, uh, Chris from Crosstalk, he started, uh, he actually found my video was something chat GTP recommended. Well, this wasn't the top result. Hold on. There we go. But they have they have instructions on how to do it and how to set up WinLog beat. Ingest beats, ingest syslog, journal D. ChatGP, he's just reading um, these to you, how to ingest syslog and things like that. So, I mean, it's just reconstituting it a little bit better. I don't know. <laughs> with the redundancies across various tech companies what areas do you think you'll see consolidation in uh who knows it's hard to say didn't microsoft announce they want to integrate chat GPT to bing i don't know if they're going to integrate into bing they're just going to throw a lot of money at it Not sure about the lag time. That's the part of you know, with the Brave browser I think matters the most is the lag time. So, yeah. Oh, uh, well, nonetheless, I'm going to get off the chat GPT topic because I, you know, I said my piece on it. And Tom has a video about Greylog. Yes. <laughs> I need to do a new one. Um, and I haven't loaded five yet, but five, someone... More than one someone, I should say a few someones, have said that the documentation is incomplete. So I'm going to reach out to the Greylog people to talk to them and uh, to see what is missing and go through it myself and see about getting Greylog 5 set up and updating their instructions if there's a mistake in there. I know I tried doing an in-place upgrade and it broke. So I'm still on the latest four point something release because the 5 version of Greylog broke. So I'm just going to build a new one from scratch. And the reason why... Also is because I want to switch to open search instead of elastic. And so I need to make a new video that's going to walk through all those steps. Uh, what's your experience on Rancher or Harvester? I don't use it, so I have no experience on it. I do like Portainer. I use Portainer. So let me pull up. for If you haven't seen Portainer, you can find a few people that aren't me that have done videos on it. Uh, Portainer works well. Whoops. 
But uh, yeah, port portainers a nice way to manage them. I just don't use the other ones. So use whichever one makes you happy. Now I have too many tabs open. Let me close some of these tabs. There we go. We're down to the one tab open again. Uh, do you have a video on how to configure Zen Orchestra for 2FA? I don't know why that would need a video. Um, you click the button for 2FA. It's not... Let me find it. Actually, I probably need to sign out. I think I have a guest user I can sign in as. Actually, do I have a guest user? Yes. So let me disable it. And I actually, for the guest user here, this, this is my lab user I've used for demos. Share this tab instead. But uh, are you sure you want to add OTP authentication? Okay. There's your video on it. There's my OTP th authentication. And now it's off. Are you sure you want to remove OTP authentication? Okay. All right. <laughs> That's why I don't think it needs a video. You just click the button to turn it on. Uh, you know, it'd be great. An official Greylog Docker image, an example Docker Compose. This, uh, they already have an official Grey, uh, Docker image. So you can do it in Docker. Uh, that's completely doable. There's no problem there. And that may be a better way to do it because it has all the dependencies in there to do it in Greylog, uh, to do Greylog with Docker. So uh, should I upgrade my Synology from 6 to 7? Heard there was some drawbacks. I, I'm using the latest. I don't have a problem with it. Gray log my home labs, syslog ng uh, is simple but ugly. Yes, it is. Been looking at Duo with YubiKey for more 2FA. Yeah, Duo's a popular system. It works. Uh, Portainer required a very complex password. After one of the versions upgrade, next release, you could toggle complexity yourself. Just use complex passwords. I don't even know my passwords. My passwords are all like something long and complicated done by my password manager. And if yours aren't, why aren't they? I don't think I have anything hardly running in here. Four containers? What am I running? Why am I even running? Oh, I was playing with a YouTube downloader and website shot. I just have a couple of containers. I use this mostly for testing things. Uh, it's not really a production use. Well, kind of a production use because if we go to this, I guess you could solve my uptime Kuma Pi. Uh, Uptime Kuma is production use. We use it in our office to let us know if things are down. Are you feeling down? Is your servers down? Hey, good. All systems operational here at Lawrence Systems. Everything's green because if it's red, it's dead. That's what it said. Zoom in a little more. Whoops. If it's red, it's dead. Everything's green. Should I take something down so we can see it in action? Create notices? <laughs> uh, the only thing I don't like about Greylog and Docker is um, I have so many different ports open up because I set a different port for everything that I'm ingesting. I mean, it's not that hard to do. I just got to map them all in Docker as well. So I just have to decide if that's how I want to do it. I have a video on uh, FIDO2. So FIDO2 is great. I like it. I recommend it. Which is, uh, matter of fact, the YubiKey supports FIDO2. And I did a video on a key that's out of reach. I'm trying to remember the name of it. If you type in FIDO2, I talk about the different keys. But I do have a uh, YubiKey. Um, yeah, that's right. This camera's on fixed focus. This is a YubiKey. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you can set your Docker network to host. Ah, you know, that's what I was, I was going to ask that. 
So it does support it because I know I did. I was hoping their Docker supported it. If it does, perfect. Then that might be a better way to do the install is just building it all in Docker because then I can just update the containers whenever there's a new version. I think that makes sense. David G, thank you for the comment. I think that sounds like a great idea for how to do it. You know, I mentioned in here, and I didn't get to this yet, so I probably should get to it now. I'm close to doing this review. Let me uh, get logged in here. And we'll share the tab. But the uh, Synology Flash Station, uh, working wonderfully. Uh, I am going to have the review done very, very soon. This has been a great system. Uh, it's fast. The I uh, got to make my I familiarize my familiarize myself with how to do this. But the ability to where's it at to take your active backups and turn them into next. Restore instant restore to a Synology virtual machine. I'm going to do a demo on that because it's just kind of cool. You can back your system up and then when you want to restore it, just do it instantly. And when you have something as fast as the flash station, oh, it just works. Uh, it works very well. And so I've been really impressed with it. I have some videos coming soon. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? I'll share this tab instead. Yeah, this is the, the hardware on it. Clean, it's nice. I have, like I said, I made some videos that I gotta, I gotta put all together and things like that. This is how I do all the B rolls. So I was just thinking some of the B roll before I get the review done. But this, this sounds like Flash Station definitely a solid, uh, solid system. So the more good Synology fun stuff. Uh, notice they've expanded a number of keys to look like YubiKey 5 NFC. Okay. It's so damn fast. Yes, it's fast. And it's also, um, it's fast and it also does the, uh, just uh, like it's a wind tunnel. Is what I'm trying to, this is the word I'm looking for is wind tunnel. We, we're staying in our kitchen area of our office, which is by our lab. And that thing is still blowing air all the way over on the other side of the kitchen, like eight feet away. And uh, it was just kind of cool. Uh, use traffic uh, with label and URL. You never use can, but these are these are ports for not traffic. So it will work for what you for doing um, like proxying. But me talking about gray log is talking about ingestion of all the different syslogs. I don't think traffic's ideal for that. Yes, the apps make all the difference when it comes to Synology. They do. Backup exec uh, did that years ago for restore from physical to virtual. Yes. Uh, to do. What are the stats on your Synology NAS? Um, they have all their stats listed for that. I'll at least cover. Hold on before I share this. Do, do, do. Where is the info button? See, these are okay. I you know I want to make sure it's not tied to my Synology account, so to throw all that account information on here. Add to stream. Uh, specs on it are. Intel Xeon D fifteen forty ones and thirty two gigs of RAM. So in this, the specific model is an FS thirty four ten. So this is your flash station thirty four ten. And if we go to the storage, doo -doo -doo -doo, storage manager, not SAM manager, and we've got uh, nine terabytes inside of here. So these are a bunch of. Uh, Synology SAT 480 gig SSDs in here, 24 of them to be specific. So 24 uh, 480 SSDs in there. So it's going to be fast. Definitely a fast system. Uh, I might, I got to do a little bit more testing because I want to test out a few of the other things in here like Synology Drive, but 
you know, the biggest things we use from a business is going to be surveillance station. That's one of them. Uh, some of their synchronization tools are cloud sync. They're hyper backup. The hyper backup is just really great. I actually like the log center. Um, it's a basic logging server, but hey, it's built in. So why not use it? Um, I matter of fact, with my server here, let me pull mine up. I've been using log server on mine for a while. So if we pull up my, let me switch to it, pull it up real quick here, share this tab instead. Um, matter of fact, I'm actually running, I, uh, playing with some of the Docker containers in mine. I just have Uptime Kuma running at home, but uh, Synology can run Docker. It's a little bit different. It's just not, it's not the standard command line native Docker, but it's good enough. It'll get the job done uh, to run a few extra non-Synology apps. Uh, when is IX system going to release a new roadmap for scale? What is the roadmap you're looking for? What are you asking when the next release is? I don't understand that question exactly. Cool thing about modern Synology is some even support Docker. Yes. Yeah. If you get a model that supports Docker, it's great. Uh, we'll be involved more in DDN storage. What is DDN storage? Oh, data, data direct storage. Hmm. But let's pull up the true scale roadmap because they have a roadmap and it's published. Come on. Oh. Do I have to log into this one? Let's see. I got to log into it. I think they moved it all to Jira. There we go. I had an account already. They do have a roadmap, though. In, so you can look at all the different things they're working on. Uh, do they have a release dates for this? February looks like their next targeted release. So U4 is targeted for Tegory, uh March. So March 28th is the new version of scale. But I they're very open about their roadmaps for things. So that answers the roadmap question for those wondering. I'm looking to get a sound, but I can't find out how loud the rack mount version is because my desktop is nice and quiet. The rack mounts are loud. Uh, I will be doing a decibel test just to talk about that as a, a, as part of it. They're not quiet. They're not designed to be quiet. They're rack mount. Rack mount devices are not always the quietest of devices. The, it's usually not their purpose. Their purpose is efficiency of air movement first. And, well, I mean, they don't go out of the way to be noisy. They just don't go out of the way to be quiet. Uh, ButterFS. So the way Synology implements ButterFS works really, really well. So... They don't use it for the RAID to talk to the drives. They're still using your standard Linux RAID. And then they use ButterFS on top of Linux RAID. So it's a good combination the way they do it. Hello from France. A Synology appliance can run so many things. Reminds me of the Unicorn, one box for everything um, that you and Jay were talking about. I wouldn't quite call it that because I wouldn't. It's not really your firewall. That's where that's where we were getting at when we talked about the one box unicorns. Uh, but it does do a lot. And I think they do a good job of packing a lot of functionality in there. Uh, what's a good way to back up Bitwarden on Synology VM? Uh, CLI method or sync thing or something else? How are you doing it? Uh, Bitwarden, I back up with uh, sync thing because that's the easiest way to do that for me. Um, I use sync thing to back up all my stuff. I need to do an updated video on sync thing because there's been enough changes over time um, to warrant a video. But let me pull, I'm going to pull up sync thing just so people can see it. So many clicks to get to all the logins, but uh, yeah, I just use sync thing and it talks to like, Hey, look, there's all my um, unify backups that are happening all the time. There's my Bitwarden SQL backups, my business document backups, uh, all my other server config backups. Anything we have is constantly being backed up at any given time. And 
you know, this is one of those things like it's automated. You automate your backup system this way. So it just synchronizes and sends wherever it needs to go. And you can see where it sends it to other systems. And some of these systems are off site. And it also has my desktop synchronizes with this. And yeah, once you have all the servers talking to this directly, it just works uh, much better. Uh, first major mistake, my new Synology, disable all the service for all users by default, actually locked myself out. Whoops. Did a soft reset to get back an AM account, then realized that VMs are running on the shared storage, corrupted all of them. Uh, think, yes, backups are important. Uh, does TrueNAS or Synology support active cluster? You can do, um, I have a failover video on Synology and I've got failover videos on TrueNAS core. Uh, it's better to watch those videos where I explain how it works for those. It's not the same as Ceph clustering, if that's the if that's the question. Issue with true apps not deploying. Oh, true charts is probably what you mean. Uh, not deploying when you set up a host path and data set and shared SMB. Yes, I have definite problems with. Uh, I probably still can show you one of them. So I'm trying. I'm using the true charts, and I. I don't get it. Um, close all these tabs I have open. But I'm using, because I wanted to test it out. This is one of the really annoying ones right here. So I am I was testing out Joplin. And uh, I used Joplin, but I wanted to try the Joplin server. True Charts had it. So I was like, hey, let me try their deployment. So let's go ahead and edit their deployment. If we edit the um, deployment here. So edit. Zoom in a little, make sure it's easy for people to see. So the Joplin server is all set up. And look at this, host path. Host path for what? Host path for app config storage. So we see Mount, Dozer, TrueCharge, Joplin. We've pretty clear that this would be where my app storage is, right? Well, let's go ahead and open up ourselves a system shell. And uh, we're going to go to CD slash mount. Dozer. True charge Joplin. No data in there. I don't know where it's storing the data. I gave it the host path. And it doesn't put the data there. So I've got some puzzles that uh, worry me is the best I could describe it. Like I get worried when I see things like this because I'm like, why isn't it doing the thing it's supposed to do? you should be able to um, store your data where it says, and then your data actually be there. This is the problem I've had with some of the apps on TrueNAS scale is they don't have a good way like to store your data and make it clear where your data is or give you a clear path by which you can restore your applications. It's not just about setting it up. It's about having a whole process for, um, it's, it's a whole process for, understanding where your data gets saved and being able to restore it if you need to. That whole process should be understood before you start relying on it for something critical. Uh, do, 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 do. I noticed you have acoustic foam behind your racks. Is that stimming cut down rear exit fan? Noise for swapping? And Noctua is a uh, real answer. Noctua is a real answer. It only cuts down a little bit. You get The, the foam helps, but it's very limited. It doesn't... It, I had the foam up there for my old studio. It's not something I would tell you to go out of your way to do to uh, do that. So, uh, Hayek Systems does have fancy NASes with two motherboards. That is absolutely true. Uh, run TrueNAS apps, the same user permission as Samba, and a share will work. That's another solution, too. This is a whole other thing. Some people really like the noise. If you like the white noise, that's a different thing altogether. <laughs> so if you are a lover of white noise, then don't worry about it at all. If you're trying to record uh, YouTube videos, the white noise, not so liked. Spent six hours trying to install two charts plex and would not deploy. Uh, so, yeah, there's... The system's not perfect, that's for sure. I will, you know, I'm going to do a new video soon on TrueNAS versus, and going to focus on scale mostly, 
uh, TrueNAS versus Synology. When it comes to deployment and ease of use, I'm not going to lie, Synology is going to be easier for less experienced technical people. Hands down, Synology just is really turnkey. If I want to go through and install something on my Synology and go through the package manager to do it, I just go here, pick the thing I want to install and install it. It's so like it's intuitively easy in here uh, compared to doing it with some of the other systems. Like, hey, cool. They have a note station. Hmm. I wonder how hard it is to install note station. I can probably click install and three clicks later. It just works. What else do they have in here? Their calendar. They have a directory server, SSO server. They package a lot of great things. I love the Synology photos. I think Synology photos is great. So another really good utility that they have in here. Their virtual machine server. Eh, it's not the best, but it gets a job running. Do I have a running VM in here? No. I thought I got rid of them all. I've created some VMs. Their VM manager um, definitely works. So, ah. <laughs> a totally silent uh, server room. Yes, I've been in, you know, uh, my friend Jason Slagle, he had, he had a mention one time because he had hit the button, the power down button, because there's an emergency. If you've ever powered down a data center, there's an eerie feeling and some trouble that's going to come with that because you had to shut everything off because things are going wrong. Um, but yeah, hitting the big bread button. So, <laughs> but I am going to wind this down here in five minutes because I'm going to an event today. The event I'm going to uh, is the IT and the D event I mentioned at the beginning of the show. So it is a local event here in Detroit put on uh, by my friend, Bob. I mentioned it before. I, I don't go there all the time. Um, it is a podcast. It is a podcast I've been on a couple times in case you're wondering about it. Um, Bob talks to technical people and things like that. Uh, it, it's just a nerd meetup of people. So it's one of the local events I go to. Hi, I'm from Germany. Have you had problems with NSC? The current version of PM Sense and Hyper-V. I don't use Hyper-V at all, so I don't know. I never use Hyper-V, so I can't really answer that question. I end up installing VMs on a hypervisor, leaving TrueNAS pure storage. Technology DSM is very nice. Shame about HCL. Uh, hey, Tom, what VPN recommend to work with Active Directory, seen WG Portal? Uh, Active Directory usually is going to be OpenVPN. OpenVPN and tying it into your Active Directory for authentication it's a common, it's a well-documented setup. Is there other ones out there? Probably. Would I recommend them? How well vetted are they? How secure are they? I will say that the OpenVPN tied together Active Directory is both documented and I'm not aware of any flaws in that configuration. Yeah, if I lean in and out, I'm definitely out of focus. So I'm perfect focus probably there. I'm out of focus here. I can turn focus, auto focus on. There we go. It, and as long as I stay centered, it'll focus. Or it'll focus on the background. Because I have things in the background. So it'll focus. As long as I peep my head in the middle, if I put this in the middle, it'll focus on this. I This got 3D printed in my office. And I don't know why and I don't care. Because I like it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, you've been in one of those soundproof chambers. Those are awesome. Oh, you got a new bike. That's awesome. I will check that out. I also, this is one of the cool things I have too. I like this a lot. Who knows what that is? Besides something that sits on Tom's shelf. Oh, uh, let's see. Nice autofocus on the middle finger in the background. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, someone smashed that like button. We got uh, 175 watching, 53 likes. <laughs> um, this is actually something novel that I have. So this is an old uh, drive here. You can tell by how old this is. But what I like is um, somewhere on here, it's got the model. The model name made me laugh. Where is the model on this? 
Oh, okay, it's on this side. Yeah, these were their early cloud drives because they were cumulus drives. <laughs> this is uh, from Connor. I think Connor was later bought by Seagate, if I'm not mistaken. Someone could probably correct me on that. But they, uh, they, they were using cloud terms in whenever this was made, probably late 80s. Uh, they were using all these cloud terms on these devices. So... Maybe reality is blurry and the camera's fine. That's a possibility. Yes, that's a virus. People got it right. It's a virus. Oh, I don't even know if this is eight gigs. Hmm. I'll have to fire up some uh, retro hardware and get this connected. Yeah, Connor Technologies. Four hundred eighty megs. Mm. Probably. I'll look up the model number in here. Does it say on the side? Here's, it is a, here, let's look it up. It's a, um, Connor CP-3104. I'm sure we can find this somewhere. And of course you can. So it's a 100 meg drive. 100 megabytes. Does it have the year it was built? It does not. Maybe someone else does. This is something I don't understand. It's like the most garbage SEO thing ever. Who do you think came up in the search results that has this drive? So here's the drive specs. It's a 100 meg drive. Okay, Seagate did purchase them, so my memory's right. Uh, this is IDE, not MFM or RL. It's not that old. Good old Winchester disc, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't... Yeah, no, this is IDE. This isn't there. But this is my dumbest SEO result here. Wait for it, wait for it. There we go. Walmart has it. Because Walmart indexes everything and throws it into there. You can buy it through Walmart. So Walmart's trying to be the everything store. So oh, currently out of stock, really? You're out of stock on, you know, Connor uh, 100 meg drives that are from forever ago? <laughs> like, really? Walmart doesn't have it. I guess if Walmart doesn't have it, I don't need it. Um, let's go to share this tab instead. There we go. Yeah, this is the another page on it. Neat jumpers, product mangle. I was looking for the year on it. This thing is old. I I like some of the old hardware. It's kind of cool to watch. Oh, 1990. So it's probably made in the 80s or early 90s. Lots of good information here. If you want to dig into it. I, I love some of the old hardware channels too. Uh, do you actually have more information about the new PF Sense version? It'll be another video. I did a video on it and covering it. Um, I kind of forgot to mention here. My mention is it still runs great. I haven't had it. It's been a, a couple more days since I uploaded the video. I've had no problems running the latest version of PF Sense. It's just, that, matter of fact, this video is running through. Let me, I will pull up my PF Sense right here. Stop talking about old hard drives for a minute. Um, but yeah, this is my current version of PF Sense, and I loaded it now six days ago. This just works. Like I, I've been really happy with the latest uh, 23 upgrade. So it's been solid. So that's I I started I wanted to talk about today, but I, apparently I got sidetracked by everything else. Overall, though, I do have a video on 2301 RC, and uh, I recommend people upgrade to it. Like give it a try. Use the boot environments, and you don't have much to worry about in terms of if things are uh, if things go wrong. I hate that spammy SEO trick. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Thanks for the Cloudflare video. Never know that they offered a free service. Been running uh, reverse proxies, VPS for yeah. Cloudflare's got some cool services they offer. They're definitely um, they work great.
Ooh, you still have one of your uh, quantum fireballs. Awesome. All right. Well, I've won this. This has gone a full hour and a half. Thank you all for joining me. This is a fun discussion. I love engaging with all of you. And so far, um, I started this at the beginning. You can leave comments if you have some information or DM me on Twitter. But uh, let me know if you're using that Cisco dashboard and you don't hate it. Because that's that's my question is, do you use a Cisco dashboard and do you hate it? I can leave that question out there for people now because um, I'm not impressed with it. And uh, so I'll leave you all with that. I'm still going to work on it and get it working. And that way I can at least tell you all the steps it took to get it working and let you decide if you think it's a good solution or not. And then I'll do my Cisco review video. But thanks you all for joining me. I'm going to go hang out and have a beer with some tech nerds. And uh, I got to do it at their place, though. So thanks for everyone. And I'll see you next week.